This is the Cheers Podcast. Hi, I'm Patrick Everett. I'm here with Arturo Alonso in the studio. We'll be discussing three overarching topics affecting our community, immigration, welfare, and the recent Rio Grande LNG air permit uh, public hearing that occurred on March 8, 2018 at the Brownsville Event Center. Welcome, Arturo. First, let's talk about your run for public office before talking about the other issues. Cheers. Uh, first of all, uh, what was the public office? Which public office were you seeking? Yes, I was running for Texas House District 37, a district that covers the lower Rio Grande Valley. So it's Laguna Vista, Laguna Heights, South Padre Island, Puerto Isabel, Los Fresnos, a chunk of Rio Hondo, Bayview, and all of South Brownsville. Okay, so it's mostly on the east side of Brownsville, not the west side of Brownsville. Nobody eats. <laughs> um, let me. No, it's it's gerrymandered. So let's look at the district in its um, totality. It goes from Amigo Land Mall all the way to Central Middle School. Okay. It goes all the way to Stell. Then from Stell, it goes through the public library. Then it's going to extend all the way to the Waterburger. After the Waterburger, you're going to keep on going all the way straight until you hit the um, Auto Zone and make a left. And as you're heading to Los Fresnos, I just want you to cut off everything that is Cameron Park all the way to 511. So the district was gerrymandered in the sense that um, it protected one seat and it made it heavily Democratic. That was Rene Oliveira's seat. Mm-hmm. And this was understanding, too, that Rene sat in the redistricting committee in 2011. The other seat that is shared here in Brownsville, it's... Um, Eddie Lucio the third. His district, though, it is a lot wealthier than ours. So as you have one that is the poorest district in the country, his is actually, if Republicans really want to target a seat, it will be his and it will be Oscar Longoria's. So they protected Sergio Munoz's seat, made it extremely Democratic. Armando Martinez's seat is all of like West Laco area, extremely Democratic, and ours. And they made two kind of swing left, swing right. Um, his district covers the rich portions, Eddie Lucio III of Harlingen. Mm-hmm. It covers the rich portions of La Feria. And that's like District 38? Yes. And yours was District 37. 37. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that if they would have given us Cameron Park, then it would have been extremely, um, the numbers would have been extremely higher for like downtown Brownsville's poverty ratio is 73.9%. Um, from Porter all the way to Garcia, you have a range between 53.3% all the way to 69. Um, and then you have like South Padre Island with a poverty ratio, almost like the U S. So the U S poverty ratio is 13 South Padre Island's 18. Port Isabel is 36. Um, then you have Laguna Heights that there's no real, like they classify Laguna Heights with Laguna Vista. So it's like a really rich neighborhood in a colonia together. And that number in itself is 41.5%. If you take away Laguna Heights, if you take away Laguna Vista, Laguna Heights would be a lot higher. It would be looking like downtown or Cameron Park. Okay. And how was your experience running for the state office? It was, I run campaigns for a living, but then running your own campaign, is a lot different. Um, we built the campaign in a model that was 100% grassroots. We placed our bets on the people. Um, I had never really done that. We have ran campaigns where super PACs and special interest groups give us $3.3 million. And then they tell me, go run. Uh, run Catherine Cortez Masto's campaign for U.S. Senate. Run Hillary's campaign. On this time around, I decided to do something different. And looking at the high levels of income inequality, looking at really low turnout in our district, 
and looking at a political structure that is like the PRI in Mexico, in which um, you're using politiqueros, the Democratic Party is extremely close. Um, you have long tenures, 10, 20, 32 years, 40 years with Lucio Senator. Um, I decided to raise all the money on the ground. Um, and I decided to run a campaign, despite I had a lot of heavy negative opposition research. We stood fast on it because I think that the most important thing that we had to do is educate the public on the issues that matter. And on that in itself, though, we ended up finding out that we had large support. We knocked on over 90,000 doors, spoke to 9,000 people. Our issue was not getting the support. Our issue then came out to turn out. Um, because most of our voters, I'll put it in perspective, I had the Texas Observer come in. And the Texas Observer came in and they're like, okay, let's go and knock on doors. He asked me, like, hey, you're, where are you getting your numbers from? I'm like, I'm getting my numbers from the Texas Tribune. I'm getting my numbers from City Data. I'm getting my numbers from the New York Times. And this is 10 months of, like, research because I have a nonprofit and I have a super PAC on the back end. Um, again, addressing the same issues. And we went and we knocked and we spoke to 13 people. Out of the 13 people, nobody had ever been paid overtime. Only one individual, Miss Rosa Torres, had health care. She was 94 years old. Everybody was making less than 10 bucks an hour. Everybody was working either one job less than 36 hours per week or two jobs at 20 and at 18. And none of these people, all 13, had ever been knocked. Most of these people, for the exception of Ms. Torres, knew who Oliveira was. These are people who've been in Brownsville for 30 years. I'm 27. Everybody that I spoke to was older than me. And when you have that, right, people don't know they're elected officials. People have never been knocked at. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party have never run a GOTV operation here. Like you have in San Antonio or you have in Houston. And um, it's hard when most of the voters have a perception. Here's the thing. The voter's not dumb. And when you're trying to ask them for your vote, most of them come from one angle. And this angle is, ¿Pa qué votos si todos son iguales? How am I going to know that you're not going to be as corrupt as the next one? And then I will answer, look at our platform. Like I'm capping myself at only serving for six years. Um, I'm donating everything back to you guys. And even with that, we had a lot of people that told us, yes, we never had one person said no. Because we're knocking on the doors. But then, how do you turn them out? We, we send them texts. We send around five passes of texts. We got an in-kind contribution from Hustle. Of like, probably, if you look at the numbers and how much they charge, it was probably like $21,000. And we texted all 9,000. Um, we had um, digital ads specifically targeted to those same homes. Um, and... We ended up growing our digital audience from zero to 3,023, but we spent over $5,000 on Facebook. Oh, wow. On Facebook. I, on Facebook alone. So, no, 21000 on Hustle, in-kind contribution, right? We spent probably around 5763 um, And I know this because we ran out of money four days before the election, and they're like, you owe us 736 bucks. And now I look into my account and it's like, I owe another 863. So we spent like, we blitz Facebook. So we blitz Facebook. We sent texts. We had people's emails. Um, some emails will bounce back and we remove them, but we send. Pff, we got your email the first day. We were sending in the beginning around four to 10 emails per, per week. And then as GO2V, um, started early vote, we will send like one every two, three days, right? Mm -hmm. So people got emailed, people got texted, people got hit on, on social media, but then we did not have the capacity of calling every single individual. Again, we ran out of money, yeah. right? Um, but people did get a call to volunteer and people did get called to ask for money. So we felt short on, on, on two venues, right? It is making... Here's the thing. When you run for office, um, you need to ensure that you built the capacity that allows you to knock on every single door that you knock already once, five times. You have to do five passes. 
to put it in perspective for Sylvester Turner, um, the mayoral race, we turned out more African Americans than Barack Obama did in 2015, a municipal election. And I was in charge of African American turnout. We knocked every single precinct nine times before early vote. And then we knocked it three more times. We had over 218 active interns. And here, that's where we slacked because we had 21 on paper. Reality was seven. And it was the same seven. Um, we could have, we never hit our fundraising goal of 60,000. Um, we had a lot of fundraising captains. The issue with us here was the flight rate. The what? A flight rate. Oh. Like, meaning people telling us, yes, I'm going to go knock. Yes, I'm going to go knock. Yes, I'm going to go knock. Day comes up, they don't show. Up. And then they feel guilty. And then they don't pick up your phone. Mm. Um, I had, personally on my end, I had like six fundraising captains that I knew personally, either A, since high school, were my doctors, were friends and family. Nah, even my own brother. Because either A, they thought we were going to win. Or B, you have to be able to ensure that you start building here in Cameron County, right? Um, at large, a grassroots operation in which people are really getting active. Like, people need to understand that when you're placing your bets on them, then when you ask them, can you raise me $3,000? It's because your 3000 is a fragment of that 60000 and even though you explained it to them, um, they get it, but they don't know the importance. And I think now that they know we lost, like, they feel bad. Everybody's texting me. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I should have done this. I should have done that. But I think that's a good first step. Um, yeah, for me, I, uh, I always figure that the money power is always behind you right now, um, especially with uh, Rene being in the incumbent. Well, I remember one of your campaign stops in El Hueso del Fraile. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see you there just to see your positions. Um, and I got you, oh, I heard you say that the Democrats, the National Democrat Party, they don't come down to the Rio Grande Valley because this is for sure thing. They're going to get, get it. They're always voting Democrat. And so they don't bring in the money down here. Uh, I remember you discussing it briefly during that campaign stop. Can you retouch on it? Uh, yeah. Basically, what was, why is that? So it was actually when we started the pack, right? We started the pack in a view after I came back from Las Vegas. Um, I quit my job in the teachers union and came back to start a nonprofit and a political action committee, specifically south of San Antonio, because there's no progressive infrastructure. When you're talking about the C4 table, understand that progressive and Democrat are the same thing. But you can't say Democrat because you cannot be um, partisan. Yeah. So you just use conservative and you're Republican. You use progressive and you're Democrat. When I spoke to the Democratic Party, the individual in charge of the C4 table. Mm -hmm. So understand that C3 is a nonprofit status. C6 is labor unions. So what ends up happening is that nonprofits and labor unions will create a muscle. And that muscle will become a super PAC. And that is defined as a C4. And what ends up happening is, are you familiar with CPAC? Yeah. On the conservative side? Yeah. Okay. CPAC is the C4 table of the Republican Party. Nothing happens by accident. Meaning this, you have a lot of old white men who sit down in a table and they dictate, right, what the messaging is. So the reason why we, on the Republican, you're always going to hear about immigration, um, guns, abortion, um, the free market. So the free market is pushed by this um, Austrian school of economics, the Koch brothers. Yeah. And those are the things that are dictated by the CPAC table. And those are the things that are also discussed where? In the mm -hmm. Republican Party and every white Republican candidate. On the Democratic bench, you have a heavy group, which is like Planned Parenthood, Emily's List. And this is why you have equal pay for equal work always like, like, like hit. You have a strong LGBTQ lobby, and then you have all the labor unions come together. When I spoke to them and I asked them, hey, can you guys help me <clears throat> build a progressive infrastructure here? They told me that I was too smart to be doing this, that it was almost nearly impossible for me to do, 
because who is giving me money? Who are my donors? On one end, and two, why should we invest in the lo- in the Rio Grande Valley if there's a lot more density in Houston? There's a lot more Latinos in in Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio metroplexes, and and we don't even vote. So what they're using is 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 either something really I don't know, efficient, right? If I know that I spend $10 and these $10 are going to be spent in knocking on this door and this door actually is going to turn out, why would I spend $22 south of the border where there is a lot of small little towns? Our canvassers have to knock and then drive instead of just being dropped off in one neighborhood, which I think it's, I think we're dense enough. <laughs> we have 1.4 million people in Hidalgo County alone. But that was their view. A, our people don't vote. And B, why are we going to spend money in a region that it's going to cost us more to turn out? And I think that's just, I don't know, Patrick, but sometimes it's going to cost you. And I'll tell you what we did in Nevada. We knew that the Hillary Clinton campaign and, got their, and, and Catherine Cortez Maslow were going to hit the high propensity voters. These are voters that are always going to vote. And we give them a score. Right, so if you never voted, you have a score of zero. If you voted on the past four out of six presidentials, or the past four out of the four presidentials, will give you a score between seventy to one hundred. So we were in charge as a C four table, hitting everybody from sixty nine point ninety nine lower, and we did spend a lot more money in turning out really low propensity voters. But that's what we did, and that's how we won, and that's how we flipped the state. Texas is not willing to do that. They're not willing to put the risk. They're not willing to understand that, yes, it's going to cost you more, but it's also going to cost you more because you've never spent the money here. So at the end of the day, it's going to average out. If I've never spent any money in South Texas, but I do spend, and I spend three times as more than the whole state right, per average, then I'm going to get... Um, my returns back. Why? The only two variables that predict voter turnout are age and voting history. That's it. And if I'm able to make you, Patrick, if I'm able to make your neighbor or anybody here a voter once, then it's more likely I'm able to make them a voter again. So if you turn out somebody in the Democratic primary, right, who's never voted, but voted in 2008, most of our voters were not the Hillary voters. Most of our voters were the Barack Obama in 2008. And that's it. Or the 2016 Bernie voter. Mm-hmm. Never voted. Like, those were our people. Um, however, Bernie has been, was the only one who actually spent resources. You have our revolution here. Like He had chapters of um, organizers who are either A, volunteers, or B, they were paid across the Rio Grande Valley. I'm going to ask you this question. How much... How many organizers did Hillary have here in the Rio Grande Valley? Zero, right? Um, the only other campaign who's ever done this here was the Wendy Davis 2014. Hmm. But you see that it's it's based on a candidate, not based on the party. Yeah. Um, we need to be able to change that because if we're not able to make... We had lower turnout... Okay, so watch. Historic turnout on the Democratic side surpassed since 19... 19- 90, I'm sorry, 1994 or 1988, we had higher turnout than one of those two elections, right? So it was historical. If you go to the Texas Tribune, if you go to the New York Times, everybody's saying, oh my God, Democrats turned out in the numbers. Mm-hmm. Our turnout was lower than 2014. And it's one of, here in Cameron County, it was one of the lowest turnouts in history. Mm-hmm. How can you have three candidates running for Texas House District 37? And there's no political debates. There's no forums. Yeah, that's the thing I, I gets me that there's no proper venue for me to actually witness these local leaders I'm choosing to pick as my leader. And usually you have CNN, and on the national scale, you have all this infrastructure that's built on these forums, different formats, town halls, uh, different formats as well. But the ones that are here are usually structured by the power, the power structure that's already here, either the uh, economic councils that are established. They set it up and they have their own st- uh, scripted uh, questions. And Extremely I th- scripted. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's basically 
like business PR is always re repeat economic development, economic yeah. development. We're here so we could have leaders for economic development and the economic development. I, I could have a whole episode off of that. But uh, <laughs> before going on, uh, on to that topic, uh, I basically have a lack of forums in this area. So for me, I, I would love to see more of it. I know there's uh, people who are interested to see that stuff. But th that's uh, you're hitting an important deficit. I know that when we did the video, it was your sister who outreached us. And it's like, hey, um, we have a podcast. One of the things that I was thinking post campaign structure was to hit up the Young Turks and ask them for some money. Mm -hmm. Right. For the simple system. We don't have a political outreach, right? Completely nonpartisan. But also, if you want to call it progressive news, you can call it progressive if we're hitting the grassroots, right? We've had, look, I emailed every single reporter at a list of 281 in the state of Texas, including the Brownsville Herald. We didn't get shit, man. Nada. It was the Young Turks. It was the Texas Observer. It wasn't until people started realizing that we were might going to win this campaign, like we were really close to winning, that everybody was sending us. And if you start looking at their postings, here's the thing. We ended up announcing December 11th. December the 16th, um, Alex Dominguez announces, but uh, Alex gets covered. We don't. Mm. Okay. Um, Rene would do one or two or three PR stunts. Boom. He'll get covered on the quicks. We, A, I'm a veteran. B, I'm a millennial. C, we're the only campaign with a full platform. We were the only campaign with a platform. Even with that, the media wasn't covering us. Um, and what we need to do is understand something that um, I spoke about in one of our live videos, um, giving the story of Alonso Cantu, an individual who started um, his bank. Because when he came, he's a farm worker. He was a farm worker from South Bar. Extremely humble individual. He went to college just because his sister was like, you need to go to college. And long story short, he started his construction company, and he could not meet the demand. He was making so much money. And bank after bank after bank after bank, Patrick, um, they will tell him no. Understanding, too, that in the early 70s, 80s, in McAllen, it was run by a lot of old Anglo-Saxon white men. And it was still with the view of the Mexicans were the braceros. Understanding our own history, right? Um, the Mexicans who came here um, between that wave of, of the 70s to the 90s were the sons and daughters of these braceros. And then we had a second wave of immigration. I know one of the topics of immigration is here. Mm -hmm. The second wave of immigration we had here was the free market Mexican-American, right? We had um, an open market. We had NAFTA. We had a growing downtown. And thanks to Bush, actually, a Republican, the first Bush, um, not Bush, well, Iraq. Well, NAFTA was Bill Clinton. So mm -hmm. No, what I'm talking about Bush, though, like Bush, um, the first one, mm -hmm. made immigration so feasible that if you were a mother and you had your kid here, you will become an American citizen. Like this was immigration back in the day. Mm -hmm. Republicans were not crazy um, and understanding, too, that the Braceros program was um, early 70s, right? So this was an open border. You had waves of, of Mexican immigrants. You had the old Tejano with Américo Paredes, with the Corridos. Then you had um, a second wave of, of workers. Um, and then you had a third wave of more of the middle class starting coming in, but also feasible for working class people to become U.S. citizens. Like, the fees were not as high as they are now. The process was a lot easier. Having those things, um, understanding those things, Alonso Cantu ended up opening his bank because no bank will give him a loan. Right? That's the spirit of the Mexican-American. That's the spirit of the Irish man. That's the spirit um, of the Jewish man. Here's the thing. Um, when the Jews came in um, post-World War II, they were excluded of every single profession, every single profession. You had um, Henry Ford, the owner of Ford companies, who was really anti-Semitic. Um, you had a priest, too, who was really anti-Semitic, and they closed the doors. The only job the Jew can have post 
um, so uh, post World War II was academia, right? But most of them decided, you know what, I'm not going to do academia. Let's go west. And they moved west, and they moved, and they established this little town, which was Hollywood, and they started this own industry, which was Hollywood. And understanding, too, that the German propaganda came from film, right? And they started something because we closed the door on them, right? Um, let's look at um, the Irishmen, right? There was a huge settlement in Corpus Christi back when, like, the first Irish came from, yeah. I know. If you look at the, like, Mexican-American um, War. Oh. I know the battle, the battle of uh, San Patricio, but I, I I don't know the the history of other ones who immigrated to Texas. I know there's like a clan of Everett's in Alice, Texas. In Alice, yeah. The first settlement was Corpus Christi. Um, a little bit north, you have La Virgen de Chonstad, um, a virgin that is actually not native to us Latinos, but it's native to the Irish and the German um, Catholic. Okay. Um, so when people close the door on us, I just saw a video right now in, on Facebook of the Philippines, right? They have no light. And what they ended up doing is, is, is getting a water bottle, making a circle in the roof, putting chlorine on the water bottle, and boom, they have light. So if we see that the media, right, how did the Young Turks start? Same way. There was no media outlet that was covering progressive news. I'm saying this, if, if people are not interested, because right now you have Fox News locally, you have another two news outlets, and I don't want to like say which ones they are because I'm not 100% accurate. But there's another two that are being funded by the Sinclair Group. They're being funded by the Koch brothers. They're being funded by Fox News. Yeah. This is why every single time, Patrick, that you're seeing the news is like, um, Alex Gutierrez crosses two pounds of marijuana. Alex Fernandez crosses one ounce of heroin. Um, Alex, um, I don't know, Sanchez Jones, right, is caught cruzando dos mojados. Um, that's the whole news here. Yeah, well, the, the just recent ones that just came out. Did you see those? The ones uh, the police officer at Brownsville PD was uh, caught. Was, was caught was, smuggling. Yeah, uh, smuggling, helping with the smuggling. Uh, and we have border patrols that are caught helping trafficking in our, and as well as human smuggling. So, but here's it's the, the same, issue: it's with the same story that they blast nationally. Here's the thing: like, like that's one of the things that we try to cover and ensuring that we paid our cops more. Right? You cannot fight corruption when our cops are getting paid fourteen fifty three here. Um, but that's all they cover. The only individual that we ever had here in the Rio Grande Valley who was good, we have one now. His name is Derek Garcia. I, I like him. He covers some really good stuff. There, there's uh, some people who have their Facebook pages. I won't name drop their Facebook pages, but they're they like to share historical photos. And um, but they, that's one out of many. Yeah, like you had Ryan Wolf. Ryan Wolf for me was the most noble South Texan that we had in a really long time. Like this is a guy who will go and raise money for kids with cancer. This was a guy that will go and tell the stories. But here's the thing: I, I ran because. I'm seeing too many GoFundMe accounts, right? And that's all we had. Like, he left. Now we have Derek Garcia, which I think is awesome. You have another individual called Mark Hanna, um, who's good. But at large, the Rio Grande Valley does not have a voice in either A, the super PAC table, B, the Democratic Party, C, in Austin, D, in D.C., honest to God, B, in the Republican Party. You don't have a voice. That's why I told people... I had an organization, um, Fuerza de Light, and they told me, A, like, don't tag us because we need to be nonpartisan. I'm like, the same way that I'm tagging people to join the Democratic Party, it's the same way I'm going to tag people to join the Republican Party. Um, and I don't think that's being partisan. I think that's being really nonpartisan and ensuring that we, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, join a party and be a leader, and an active leader there. Um, and we don't have a voice in the media. And I think what you're doing is extremely courageous. I know all this costs money. Um, but you're taking a risk and you're placing your bets on the people. And I think that falls in the same thesis of our campaign. And I just hope and pray to God that um, you're extremely successful, but other people join. Because if you look at the numbers in our district, 
and you have 643 families having more cumulative wealth than the bottom 90.90%. And I can go th through the numbers. I won't do that in justice because I know we have time. But here's the thing. We only have 15 years to fix this before we become Harlingen, Texas. In year 20, five years after those 15, we're going to become Kingsville. And this town's going to be a ghost town. Um, we have two, we have 1.3 families that own all the wealth and have all the wealth and make more money per year than the bottom 90. Our middle class is so fragile. It's 6.8%. And I know your sister told me, hey, like, like don't go so in debt because we want to make it positive. Uh, and some people might get sad. But here's the thing. I think you can be really optimistic. When you tell kids that they're Santa Claus, but you're poor and your parents cannot afford those gifts, then it's really sad. But when you realize that there is no Santa Claus, that your parents are the ones that are actually working hard and, and your mom is making miracles in Thanksgiving, that's Tupac. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's Tupac then you appreciate your mother a little bit more and we're able to realize that here's the thing we are the majority we're only losing because we cannot turn out and we're only losing as as a city because you have special interest groups that are buying off for politicians and you can we can cover that with LNG right um, and so more millennials are able to say, Hey, you know what? Let me support Patrick and his podcast. Um, instead of supporting NPR, NPR is already huge, right? Like, well, MP NPR, uh, just put my tidbit in there and then switch, uh, switch mm -hmm. over to the next uh, discussion. But NPR for me has become, they're, they're a good source of news, uh, uh, news. It's just, I love them. I hear them every day. I just have critiques of them as well. The Israeli coverage, uh, Venezuelan coverage, anything that's uh, dealed with hardcore progressive issues or even like past progressive. But who's progressive. covering the real Grand Valley? No, they, but when they do discuss, it's, uh, it's a little bit. It's not not much. They come down here and they usually talk to uh, ACL, uh, ACLU. Yeah, ACLU and lawyer. And it's immigration. That's it. Yeah, it's at the cabo. Yeah, it's always uh, related to that same uh, narrative talking. that they always talk about. So, I I have my critiques of them, but uh, for people who are on the fence about uh, jo joining like the Republican Republican Party or the Democratic Party or other parties per se. Uh, there's what? only two true um let's be real um there's a green party awesome there is we need to be realists and understand what are the venues of change no no i understand that i'm just saying like to participate because there's some who are going to be with the positions and they're going to be so uh, uh, stubborn on the positions that they're joining the green party or the libertarian party and that's fine we know that this is the first pass to post system. So you have to reach a certain number and it's always, those are duopoly. usually, no. So, so here's the thing, the part, the democratic part of the, look, the Republican party has parties within their umbrella. The, the libertarian party is one faction of it, but you first become a Republican, then you become a libertarian. Mm -hmm. um, the democratic party has multiple parties within its, 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 its faction, right? You have the labor. Um, if even if you look at the convention, um, they have different committees. Let's look at these committees as, as sub-parties of the party itself. And so we're able to really, I don't want to use the word infiltrate because I'm not a Machiavellian, but until we are able to say, I am a precinct chair, I'm going to knock my precinct um, three times. I'm going to make sure I go to the state convention and say, hey, instead of the bathroom bill, the most important issue for me is raising the minimum wage. The most important issue for me and my family is health care. We are able to dictate both parties and their platform if we become Republicans, if we become Democrat. Um, if you are a Republican, um, let's just say I'm a Republican and I don't want to talk about abortion. I don't want to talk about guns. For me, the most important issue is protecting small businesses and making sure we don't spend our money sending people to prison. Um, and reduce that, then I can join the Republican Party and say my platform is is uh, fiscal responsibility, is environmental protection, and it's small business. Here's the thing. Only the crazies right now are in charge of the party. Yeah. No, the, the parliamentary uh, sobriety is long gone. Uh, they are not properly functioning as a, a national party. Um, Even oh, yeah. here. Yeah. 
Well, to lead up to what I was uh, trying to bring up, uh, can you give any tips for others who are uh, who are on the fence right now for run, running in public office? We just briefly say, discussed yeah, it. Yeah, I say, look, don't be on the fence on anything. If you're going to do something, do it and do it for your city. We only have 15 years, and I want every single person to run for an office. Um, here's the thing. The study of economics is the study of the household, right? If you know how to balance your buck, um, if you know how to pay your rent and you know how to manage your own little budget, then you can run for office. You don't have to be an attorney. Um, you just cannot be a judge, right? Because a judge, you need a JD. But here's the thing. Just run. Um, run and figure it out, right? Um, run for city council. Run for county commissioner. Run for county judge. Run for governor. Run for um, your school board races. We only have less than 18% of our elected officials who are Latinas here. Uh, Texas it, House District 37. It's half and half. It's, it's 18. 18. And Latinas make up 51% of our population. Wow. Well, they're a majority. Yeah, but only 18. Rep- Here's the thing. How many Latinas have been caught stealing fajitas? <laughs> none, right? How many Latinas have been caught from embezzlement? And none. Here's the thing. And so we realize that it is our women that are going to save this town. They're the only ones that are holding us together. Um... And we don't get more women to be small business owners. If we don't invest in our women becoming tech. If we don't invest in our women actually running and winning for office. I want you to look at the numbers. <laughs> this is pretty funny. I want you to go to Laredo, Texas, Webb County, and Brownsville, Texas, which is Cameron County. Look at the total number of voters that voted for Sam Hernandez. 43 point something percent. She didn't even have a campaign. Mm-hmm. I don't even know who she is. She's the one who was right below Beto. Yes, 43%. She she was more progressive. I I don't even know who she is. Uh Nobody. I bet you the voters didn't. I bet you my mom who voted didn't even know who she was. But she saw Sema Hernandez. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. If if we got 15% with a grassroots operation, and let's say a Latina, like your sister or anybody else, um, runs, then... They have already like 40% of the vote. <laughs> you run a grassroots model, boom, you put them what? At 15, that's 55% of the vote. We start reforming the Rio Grande Valley when it's women. Um, just look at the Beto work race. Two counties, both of them getting 43% of the vote. She had no yard signs. Mm-hmm. She had no GOTV operation. But oh, Latinas stick together. But we only have one Latina in our city council. We only have one Latina who's ever been mayor of the city of Brownsville, and that's Filimon Vela's mother. We only have one Latina in Port Isabel. One Latina in the Texas Southmost College Board of Trustees, and there's somebody running against her. We have one Latina in Los Fresnos. Zero Latinas in uh, in Port Isabel. Zero Latinas in whoever represented us for Texas House District 37, for House District 38, for Senate seat 26. What I'm saying is it's always the same families with the same last names from the same little class, and our women have a higher chance of actually winning and actually reforming. Because when... I don't know. My mom always calls me and she's like, hey, you need to do your taxes. <laughs> and it's like, yes. Yeah, if they definitely came out to run for public office. I, I know I saw in the Democratic side in the state, in the state level, that there's a lot of women, also Latina, minority uh, entities, or not entities, identities, running for public office. Uh, for the last part of this, uh, the public office discussion regarding your, your run, um, what do you expect uh, doing moving forward now? after the election, after the primary? Really good question. Um, I need to, A, pick up my business because I stopped completely. Um, So, A, is making sure that I'm financially recovered. That's one end. And and, and then, B, is making sure that we find a venue, right? If it's, A, me running again, then it would be that. It'd be if it's me helping you and helping other small business owners and people in tech, ensuring that we're able to educate the public at a more macro level, then I'll do that. Here's the thing. 
people always think that I'm like hardcore ADHD or something, but poverty here is so hard because you have an extra layer, which is corruption. And you have an extra layer of, of not having a logistical infrastructure to really affect change. That You have to pull different levers. And I'll be seeing in which is the way in which I can be useful to A, make sure that there's more people like you, Patrick, and that you have more resources. So I think the things that you're doing is are great and are greatly needed. Making sure, too, that we are able to run GeoTV operations for the March, uh, I'm sorry, the May election. That we're able to bring politics to a higher level through discourse, but also not stop, right? A lot of progressives here, they run, they lose, they go into the shadows. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, where I'm coming from is I'm still going to do it. I just don't know how. If it's me saying, hell, you know what, I would just, I'm just going to run for office again to build that infrastructure and keep it going and make sure that the issues are being fought for, then I'll do that. I'm not afraid of, of running again. But again, it's not, it, it's, it's, it, it should not be me. Yeah. It, sh- it should be different people because that's the issue that we have here. It's the same people raising up their hands. And, and so we have your sister running. And so we have um, my mom running or my tias or somebody else. Like you have an elections here in Port Isabel. You, you have the Port of Brownsville. And every party, Cameron County is divided between four political parties. The old whites, the Mexican aristocrats, the progressives that never win. Um, and then like this weird little other faction of like bloggers. Mm-hmm. Right? The you. We have too many bloggers. I saw that. I think I tried to go into that, and I was like, yeah, that's not going to be... I'll I'll be a drop in the water, a drop in the bucket. But only those groups run candidates, right? Progressives are not the ones... Progressives are the only faction, right? Let's call them factions, but there are other parties. um, That does not say you run for office. That just romantically somebody comes out, right? Mm -hmm. But we need to understand that we are four parties here. And each of those four parties are at war with each other one way or the other. Um, you have the old whites who have been pushed away to the port. That's, that's it. That's all they have. You have the Mexican aristocrats who control now the city, the county, every elected office in the state, every elected office. People here run in slates, right? Like You need to understand that, for example, Rene Oliveira and... Eddie Trevino, that's one slate, versus Bob Sanchez and Alex Dominguez. How can you compete as one candidate, not running with politiqueros, not running with slates, against two machines on both ends? Um, When progressives run, it's like, oh, good luck, Patrick. Que te vaya bien. And we do show up for an event, and that's it. (laughs) You know, like, hey, we're here. One of the things we realized, too, is that we're not – I used the Bernie model, and the Bernie model kind of failed because people were giving us money thinking that the money was a substitute for the actual work that we needed them to do. It's yeah. like, no, compadre, I need, you, I need you to throw in feria, and I need you to knock on doors, and I need you to go vote. Um, if we don't do all those three things, then we're never going to move forward. And the last thing I want is to make our town look like Harlingen. I, it's sad. When I look at Harlingen, it used to be Brownsville, Harlingen, McAllen. Now it's Brownsville, West Laco, McAllen. And then right after that, we're going to turn into Kingsville. People are just going to come here to school because UTRGV is going to be real hype and real cool and real fresh and real fresh. And people are just going to come here for some Dead Fest. And people are just going to come here for spring break. Um, and people are just going to come here to bring LNG. And that's it. Like, we're just a cash cow who cannot retain their people and who cannot retain their money. All of our money leaves. Todo. Yeah. Same thing with the humans. Like some of the people who get educated, they don't come back. Yeah. Why? Cause we have no incentives. We have no jobs. And the reason we have no jobs is because we don't, you fix jobs. And this is the, this is why I hate economic development. It's not about bringing more jobs. It's making sure that the jobs we do have here are paid well. Livable as well, higher standard. Nobody here has money to spend. 
and we're not regios, you know, like, 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 like we're not codos. We go spend money when we have money, but we don't have money. Um, our small businesses are getting screwed on both ends. One, they cannot bring in revenue. And then on the second, they're getting taxed to death. But yet you're willing to give any other company that comes here million dollar tax cuts. Like when's the last time you've gotten a tax cut? No, yeah. I think this right now I'm experiencing the first one. The first one, the yeah. Trump, that the is Trump, Trump one, yeah. <laughs> Latinos for Trump. But yeah. um, <laughs> I'm just playing it. Um, don't well, I, for but, me, I I could critique it because I'm getting the the petty leftovers. Like it's not a progressive right. tax cut. Somehow, like when you do the tax cut, the majority goes to the ones who need it the most, and then the the last goes to the ones who don't need it that much. But it's the other way around. Like we have 1.4 trillion dollars in debt from student loans. I pay like 658 per month. My mom was like, I was a my was like, <laughs> 600 bucks? Um, está carito. Oh, yeah. I'm around the same uh, around the same pay. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, that concludes that discussion regarding your public office run. Uh, we'll be switching over to the discussion of immigration during this political atmosphere. But before we get into it, let's just take a break right now so we could just awesome. not be on, on the record. And cheers. Love the beer. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> song is called Adventures by Himichu, available on Spotify. And that does it for episode two of the Cheers podcast. Check out our bonus episode with Arturo, where we discuss immigration and welfare. If you're not a patron of the show, become one and support our show by making a pledge. Until next time, I'm Patrick Everett.